so you're not you know, paying too much at the beginning. You need to kind of scale up as you should hopefully be you know, making more money in it as your list grows. So at a very basic level, you know, this is what an opt-in could look like. You really just need to capture that email address, some way to subscribe, and then that, that email, that contact would go into your list. And of course, you know, this is pretty basic, so we want to spruce it up a little bit and talk about you know, how we're going to actually get more people to sign up. And the first question is kind of technically, how would you put one of those into your blog if you are using one of these services, your MailChimp or AWeber? And there's a couple ways. It's actually fairly simple. If, if you can you know, deal with WordPress you know, really on any level, this shouldn't be too tough. MailChimp, AWeber, all of those services will give you exactly the code you need. You paste it right into a widget area. That's an example here. Uh, if you are a little bit more you know, adept, you're comfortable with code, you can tweak things you know, to your heart's content. But they usually give you a pretty nice interface within the, the email login. Uh, you go to the website, you can choose some style options, and they'll give you an output of the code right there. So it's just a simple copy paste job into your website. Another thing you can do if you don't want to even see any code is you can just go plug in wrap. So this is just a screenshot of just a search for newsletter, email newsletter plugin in the WordPress plugin directory. There's 164 results. Uh, all of the popular services have their own plugins. So you can use a MailChimp plugin, you can use the AWeber official plugin, and then it'll integrate very smoothly with, with your list. So you can put it in your, uh, your widget areas. If, on the other hand, you want something a little more flashy, there are some premium services for designing very nice opt-in forms. They can integrate social sharing right in there too. So if you really want to design something you know, really eye-catching, uh, you have you know, a little bit of money to invest in that. Uh, there are options here. One that I've you know, seen on a lot of sites that, that's pretty good is called Opt-in Skin. So that just, again, really helps you design you know, more attractive opt-in forms without touching any code. And there's other similar ones like this that you can also use. Now, you know, in this day and age, it's usually not enough to just say, you know, sign up so I can send you emails. You know, we get, we get a lot of emails. Um, you know, maybe in the early days of the web, that was kind of exciting. But these days, you really have to show how you're adding value to those subscribers. You know, they want to know what's in it for them. So one good strategy to do that is to offer something in exchange for their sign-up. So this can really be anything, and it, and it depends on what, what your blog, what your business might be. But a few examples, as you can see here, it could be some sort of ebook. You know, I'm not talking like a 300 page, uh, huge, well researched book, but maybe kind of a quick guide at the top, I don't know, 10 tips for doing X, which closely relates, of course, to, to what your business is. It could be some sort of email course where you take them through, you know, a mini class learning how to do a certain thing. Uh, I think you can really be creative here. It doesn't even have to be something entirely new. So something I've done before, uh, if you have a website that you know, have a bunch of content, why not package together some of your best articles into a little PDF so you're adding you know, convenience and curation, uh, a nice format for people to read, and you know, give it a little uh, you know, nice sounding title and create a little cover image and it'll look like a nice little book. It's really the same content that's on your blog, but you're making it more valuable for your readers, so that can be your own freebie. Uh, if you've ever you know, done an interview or gave a presentation somewhere, you can offer that off to your list. Or another strategy that works well is if you have some sort of uh, premium ebook or something you're hoping to sell, why not offer you know, the first chapter to your list subscribers for free and then you know, see if they like it, and then later on you can pitch them the whole thing. So again, freebie is a really good way to do it. Uh, but you know, if you have your freebie in place, you've chosen your service, you know, maybe MailChimp or AWeber, and now you know, the question kind of turns to how do you increase the number of, of visitors uh, into actual subscribers? So it's study after study, it's really been proven that there are some spots on your blog that you really need to have your opt-in form uh, if, you're, if you're interested in optimizing for conversions. And in the first place, we'll look at a few examples here so I can you know, hopefully can demonstrate rather than just talk at you about this. And here's just one example site of scouring the web looking for interesting stuff. And one of those top places, you can see the opt-in form up on the far right, that is the top of your sidebar. So that's kind of where you get the most attention most of the time, you know, people that are kind of drawn to that area. So you want your opt-in form to be you know, top, front, center, where they'll see that. And you know, what do we see here? So this, is, this would be an example of, of one of those, I would say, email courses of practical advice. This is a site 
style, so practical advice on dressing sharply. So just first name, email, and you've got your, your opt-in right there. So you can see it's, it's very noticeable. Um, that's, that's a key spot. Here's another website where this is demonstrating the same placement over on the top of the sidebar. Uh, but notice the difference here where this is an extremely minimalist layout. You know, there's no real graphics, there's no flashy colors. But there's still a few things that, that work very well. So if you see over there where it says get updates, it's free on the side. Um, it gives you a clear benefit. Learn how psychology helps you get traffic and sales. So they're telling you what this newsletter is going to do for you. You know, in just one sentence. So it's not like it's this long thing that no one's going to read. It's just a concise um, statement of, of what the benefit is. You can see below where it uh, says get free updates, there's some social proof. So the New York Times best-selling author has endorsed the newsletter. So it's not that you need to you know, invest money in these you know, super fancy looking graphics. This doesn't even offer one of those uh, things, a freebie for signing up. It's just a newsletter. But there's a lot of things that are, that are good there. And you know, I know this is working for, for, this, uh, for this website. Second place that is really kind of considered you know, must have for your opt-in form would be right below your blog posts. So here's an example where there's a blog post. And this works really well because you know, if, if someone's going to sign up for your email list, you know, they, they have to like your content somewhat. And one of the best times to get them to do that is after they've read one of your posts. So they come down to the bottom, see a nice opt-in form. Here you can see there's an uh, e-book that's, that's being offered for free to sign up. Uh, there's also some social proof up there if people can share this post. If you see over in the corner, this is an example of that opt-in skin service I showed you a few minutes ago. So they help you design these things uh, very nicely. And again, there's other services that, that do the same thing. So this is good for, for several reasons. Here's another one. You can see this is, again, a little bit more minimalist. There's, there's no graphic. Um, but I really like the way they phrase that. So enjoyed that. Join the email. So if people did enjoy your post, you know, just reaching out and asking for them to, to come in right then is often the best time. You know, they might say, oh, that was cool. I should bookmark this blog. Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. You might lose them. But if you can get their email right at that point of, of most interest, then you'll have them you know, on your list for good. And another thing I'd like to point out, so if you can, I don't know if you can all read this, but it just says, we're writing a full WordPress tutorial ebook. Would you like updates and a 25% discount when it ships? So kind of adding a little additional uh, information there if people are interested. And that's something that is a very powerful uh, part of email marketing, and that's kind of segmentation. So you can group your subscribers into different segments and send messages to those different groups. So you, here you would have people signing up just for your list, but then also these people who are interested in that book, who you could ask for you know, advice as you publish it, and give them that discount when it actually is completed. And you know, that's, that's something that can be really helpful if you want to group your users into different, uh, different segments. Now here is what I would say is the third place that you really want to make sure you have your form. Um, this is actually an about page, about me, you know, on my blog. A lot of times, here, if you look at your analytics, your top you know, traffic page would be your home page, which is usually pretty natural. But then a lot of times your second most popular page is your about page because people come to your blog, they kind of want to know who you are, what you're all about, uh, why, you, why you're doing what you're doing. So if someone's reading through your about page, that's a great place to you know, show them, I can give you this, uh, if you want to sign up, I can add you to our list and we'll give you this great content. And here's another, I think, example of how you don't always need to have those flashy graphics. Uh, this, you know, should ask for your first, and, first name and best email and get access. And I think that's especially useful in this situation of the About page because the About page is usually something that people are going to read carefully. They're going to be pretty engaged when they're trying to figure out who you are. So, you know, but that, in that situation, they might sort of tune out some anything that looks at all like an ad. So if you have you know, a big banner, they might not. Uh, might not sign up as much, but this is closely integrated in there, so it'll probably catch their eye a little better if they read it carefully, and you, you have a good chance of, of getting them right then. So now let's kind of look a little bit on the other side. So there was this series of experiments, I guess about a decade ago, turned into a pretty popular book, and it was titled The Paradox of Choice. And kind of the argument put forth was that whereas conventional wisdom might say that we always want more choices uh, so we can make an informed decision, um, in reality, when there's too many choices, we often tend to just kind of shut down and not make any choice. So that had a lot of applications to um, logging to WordPress. And I think particularly in the area of, kind of clutter on our websites, 
particular in the sidebars. So I just found one example here where this is a site. Uh, you can see there's two sidebars. You do have the email opt-in down there, but there's so much else going on. Uh, a lot of times, I've read studies that say you really should only have you know, three or four things in your sidebar, which can be tough, you know, because we always want to add this new thing and then popular posts and categories and you know, social links and all that. But a lot of research really has shown that too many things, uh, people are just going to either ignore it or just not know what to do and just kind of X out. So I picked this example because you know, it's not like it's a, a bad blog. It's a very well-designed blog. It's a very popular uh, website that I found. But it's just really not optimized for email subscriptions. So if, if that's your priority, you really want to like, cut down on your clutter in the sidebar and really you know, put your opt-in form front and center. Here's a second example, you know, another beautifully designed site. Uh, you might notice there's not even an email opt-in in, in the screenshot because it was too far down. Uh, you can see there's things like Tag Cloud, which you know, is a pretty cool thing you know, for blogging, especially kind of earlier on in, in the life of blogging, but uh, that's probably something you, you don't really need. But again, uh, if you kind of consider what these two sites were, you know, they're food blogs, so for them, maybe this is right. Maybe you know, they're using Pinterest and Facebook to you know, share pictures and recipes. Uh, maybe email isn't their priority. But if email is your priority, then I think, you know, from what we're talking about here, I think you should definitely consider it as your priority. Uh, you wouldn't want to have you know, two sidebars. You wouldn't want to have really more than just a few options in that sidebar to kind of keep people focused and get them you know, onto your list wherever you can then you know, further engage with them. So here's, let's just look at a couple more examples. So here's one that seems to be following that logic. Uh, this is a, another example of a pretty minimalist blog. You know, there's only four things over on the side, but uh, nothing is really, nothing really draws you to this opt-in down here. Everything's kind of given equal weight. Uh, you know, the thing at the top is just view my profile. Uh, I don't think that would really be what you want your users to, to see the, the most. You know, there are some social links, but you can see it's just not really, uh, not really optimizing around that email sign. Here's the example we saw before. You know, they're kind of similar, they're both you know, just text on white backgrounds, but remember how this one, what they did have was the benefit, the social proof, the um, just even the subtle kind of color, the way the button is a different color, it draws your eye to it a little bit. Uh, here there's, there's really none of that. So uh, again, it's, I hope it's been a theme that it's you know not that you need to spend money on these beautiful designs. It's, it's a lot of times just adding the right and concise information that's showing your, your visitor you know, why the you email know, was to benefit him or her. Here's another question. So should you use a pop-up to capture an email? So there's a lot of plugins that can do this for you. Some of the services we've already talked about and a few more I'll share in a minute um, allow you to do this. So that would be the visitors on your site, <coughs> you know, just have a little pop-up encouraging them to sign up. And this one's a little more uh, controversial. I think you get, especially in certain niches, people just would say, you know, I hate pop-ups. Anything that pops up, I'm leaving that site for good. Uh, so you do sort of run the risk of maybe alienating some readers. But from, from what I've seen, you know, larger scale studies, a lot of times, I think it's an example of people kind of saying one thing and doing another, where almost everyone I've seen who's done a study on this, their <coughs> rates have increased by using a pop-up. Uh, there are certain ways you can customize it, especially with some of the better services. For example, you know, only popping up after a certain number of time, or only if you view a certain number of pages, so you know it's someone who's kind of been already engaged. Um, you can you know, suppress it for certain categories of visitors, so if you're sending them from your Twitter account and you don't want them to see it, versus a search engine visitor, you would want them to see it. There are ways to set up things like that. But it's something you want to, I think, consider, even if a few people might grumble about it, it really, really can help. Uh, but again, here is where you want to make sure that you know, your message is, is on point, you add a benefit, not looking spammy at all, so you, know, you don't want to be too salesy in that pop-up, because that can turn people off a little more, but it's definitely something to, to consider. Other little tricks, so I mentioned, you know, top of the sidebar, below your posts, and in your about page, that's kind of your, your key spots. There's obviously other things you can try. In this example, you can see the very top bar, uh, just a little thing that pops down there for an email opt-in. That can work pretty well. Here's another thing. Uh, this would be the example of the below post uh, opt-in. But you'll notice the difference here is that there's no you know, name and email. There's just a button. And that can potentially make it look like it's 
little less work to join. Uh, it's just one quick click. And usually what happens in, in these kind of setups is if you click it, you, you would get a pop-up like this. So a couple of things I like here, uh, I think it's designed nicely. You do need your email address and they can send it to you. So you might say, okay, fair enough, I'll give my email here. But if you can see the progress bar up top, it's 50% complete. So I, I like that kind of sense of urgency. I want to complete the process. It looks all unfinished. So that's just one strategy that, that can work. And of course, you know, this, some of this can be niche dependent, depending on what type of, of user, uh, tech familiarity they might have. Certain things will work better than others. So with all these concepts I'm showing, it's the kind of thing you want to test out a little bit. Uh, you know, try one thing, see how many people join, and maybe switch to something else. One thing I'm going to just backtrack now. Uh, if you noticed in some of these earlier screenshots, there's a lot of different language. So this one says, help me look better. So that's kind of very direct. Uh, this one says, get free updates. This one says, subscribe now. Usually you'll have some default language in there, and often it's just subscribe or join the list or something. That's another thing that's audience dependent that you want to test. So if you can think maybe your audience would like the symbol, just subscribe, you know, try that out for a week. Maybe say something like, help me look better. If that's you know, your kind of style blog, maybe be a little more direct and see if that changes your, your amount of email signups. So again, you want to just tweak uh, you know, both where your opt-in forms are and also how that language actually looks on the button. So to come back to where we just were, was well, here. So up to this point, we've just talked about uh, certain places on your blog. But the other thing you really want to have is a, is a dedicated page for capturing email addresses. So that's often called a landing page. And a landing page could actually mean some other things too. So often a squeeze page is, is another term that's used. And what this is going to be is, this would be an example. So just a, a dedicated page that's going to usually explain the benefits of joining the list in a little bit more detail. You can see there's some nice bullet points here. It's a compelling headline. There's, again, some social proof down at the bottom. That's, that's a concept you're going to see a lot that's very powerful. You know, some sort of testimonial that's, again, very short. You don't want it to be you know, too long or cluttered. There's also that proof up on the top with, with places the, the blog is featured. And you'll also probably notice what's not on the page. So there's no sidebar. There's no navigation at the top. Uh, for something like a landing page, a squeeze page, you really want to eliminate the options that, that your visitor has. So if they hit this page, they're either going to sign up or go away. You know, you're trying to get them when they're interested. And uh, if, you know, if you had the sidebar, they might get distracted. They might click off on several pages intending to sign up. But then things happen. They might not go through with it. So what can you do uh, when you build one of these landing pages? So I think that's where you want to send people if, for example, you are writing a guest blog on another person's site. A lot of times people would have a little bio at the bottom. My name is Andy Walsh, I have this website, go check it out. A lot of people would send people from that to their home page, but again, that's going to lead to a lot of clicking around, probably not as much focus. You say, I've got this great writing course, uh, here's a direct link to it. Uh, you get people to sign up right there and make them long-time readers. Here's another example of the squeeze page. This one uses a video, so that's another thing you can test with your audience like. Actually watching a short video, that's another thing that I think people may be hesitant to do. You know, no one really wants to sit through a video, but maybe they do. And again, there's some bullet points and benefits. And you can see there's another interesting use of language on the sign-up button to start saving money now. So you can better believe that that's been tested and, and that's been proven to, to do better than other recordings. So here's a few things you might use for designing a landing page. So one of the one of the top things considered you know, in industry standards is called meeting pages. So they help you design really beautiful uh, landing pages without really doing any coding. And they offer a lot of additional features like various pop-ups and other uh, other things that you can use. And that's that's going to be if you have some money to invest. That's a monthly uh, monthly fee. There's another thing called optimized press that, that often gets sort of compared to other pages. That is actually Lead Pages integrates with WordPress very easily. Optimized Press is actually just a WordPress plugin, so it's only WordPress. It can also be used as your full theme, so you could use uh, use that to design your full blog if you wanted, and it would give you very easy access to landing pages. Optimized Press is just a one-time fee, so it's not a monthly. And then there's also if you just do another plugin search in the directory, there's a lot of free stuff that can help you design a landing page. Some of them are kind of a, a freemium service, so you can kind of get set up. But if you want some of the additional features, you have to 
pay a little bit, but it can help you uh, help you get started and see if it's right for you. So let's shift gears a little bit now. You know, we talked about uh, setting things up and optimizing uh, their placement on your blog. But once you build your list, you know, what should you actually send them? So having a list doesn't automatically guarantee that you're going to make a dollar or even get anybody to your site. So what kind of stuff should you be sending? Uh, well, one of the top things is just your most recent updates. So keeping your, your readers engaged with what you're doing and you know, sharing your, your latest content is a good way to do that. And there's a lot of ways to do this automatically. You, know, you can set up an RSS to email where any post that gets published will automatically get sent out to your subscribers. But in my experience, I've found that you know, that's a little more automated and less personal, and you want to give it a personal touch. So this, this screenshot would be an example of, you know, instead of just auto sending out you know, the first two sentences of my post and then the link, I give it a personal message. Now, one thing that's good is if you ask for people's first name, you can customize that in the field. So let's say, you see it says, hi, Andrew, right there. It's, it's addressed to me. And it's a little bit of a background to the post. You know, you want to write a little teaser. You don't want to go too long, usually. But, uh, you know, give a little teaser and then link right into the post. I found that. That gets a lot more people to your site than if you just do one of those automated RSS things. Another thing you can do, you know, we're talking about using this to, to build real engagement. So, uh, I've seen emails where people will just directly ask, uh, you know, please let me know what you think by posting a comment. Uh, that, that can kind of work, uh, especially if it's you know, a little bit more of a personal feel there. So, blog updates, that's great, but what I said before is that the power of, of an email list is really kind of the automation of it. So, there's, there's this way you can you know, sort of be automated and personal at the same time. That's called an autoresponder. So, what this means is it's basically a series of emails that you write once, um, save it in your email program, and then anytime somebody signs up and hits your list, they'll automatically get sent that series at an interval that you determine. So, you know, day one, they get this welcome message. Uh, three days later, they get message one. Uh, message two comes a week later. It's all up to you. And typically, you're, you're wanting to build trust and getting those subscribers through a certain sequence that, that you determine. So, you want to have sort of an end game. So, is it going to be that premium ebook you have? Is it going to be pitching your services to, to a potential client? Uh, even if you don't have your own product, you know, it could be an affiliate product, it could be something from Amazon, associates even. So again, you can be creative here, just like we talked about with the freebie. Uh, here's just a, a quick screenshot of what this looks like in MailChimp. So you can kind of edit your emails, you can see who's going to get it. So you're, you're able to really determine what your subscribers are going to go through and see uh, in, a particular, in a particular period. So you're not leaving it up to chance, like what if I don't post for two weeks, you know, those new subscribers won't get anything. Uh, you can ensure that even if you're not you know, actively posting every couple days, they'll still get the content you want them to get. So how, so how should you really do this uh, autoresponder? So you, as I said, it's all about building trust, so you don't want to just pitch them with your product right off the bat, you know, otherwise you just send them to a sales page. But uh, you really want to think about you know, content messages versus promotional messages. What's your, what's your balance going to be? Do you want to be fairly aggressive? This would be a sequence that might be considered not aggressive at all. So you get a welcome message, you get three pieces of content. So again, you're kind of establishing your expertise, sharing some value. Uh, then you hit them with a promotion maybe after three content messages, and then maybe three more content, and then another promotion, which could either be a second product, it could be just a, a rephrasing of the first one. You can again segment your list into people who bought something or have it. Uh, that's something that you know, depends on what service you use, but it's almost always a pretty easy way to do that. And I think it's important to, to make the point that it's not always bad to be aggressive. Uh, take the example of a list where everyone has, say, bought one of your products. Those are people who then already trust you, so there'd be nothing wrong with maybe hitting them with, with more promotions because you've already shown value. You know, they bought your product, they probably want to know what else you might have that could help them just as much, even more perhaps. So in that case, you don't really need to necessarily mess around with a whole lot of trust building because they've already taken that first step. So again, it really depends on you know, who you are and what you want to be. And just one more thing about you know, this term aggressive. So that can really mean two things. It could be the amount of promotions you send in. That could be considered more aggressive. Uh, but also it could be the time frame. You know, if I'm going to pitch a product in three days, that would be more aggressive. I'm going to wait three weeks to take them through this long cycle of showing what I have to offer first. Uh, that would be a little less aggressive. 
So I wanted to give you just a quick sample. You know, that was a little bit more um, theoretical. So here's, say, one sample autoresponder you could use. So maybe right when they sign up, you, you have your little freebie, a, a free ebook as a sign up bonus. So you shoot that over to them right when they sign up. There's easy ways within MailChimp, Aweber, all those to, to set up a you know, file that gets sent out. Um, maybe you would choose one day after they sign up, thank them for subscribing, um, you know, encourage them to follow you on Facebook or you know, whatever is your priority. You know, just introduce yourself, give them a personal touch. Um, perhaps three days after they sign up, you, you share some sort of premium content that's you know, not even available on your blog. So sort of uh, emphasize the exclusivity of the list that they get things they wouldn't get otherwise. You know, they're, they're kind of special for signing up, they get the bonus content. Uh, this fourth email would be an example, you know, I saw before, there's content first promotion. Uh, some people would argue that there's a third category, which is really engagement. So more than just sharing your, your ideas and your expertise, you're really asking the audience to do something, asking your readers to do something. So a lot of people will send, as part of their sequence, you know, what would you like us to write about? Which, you know, helps them feel valued, but also gives you good ideas for, for what your audience wants and, and needs. So that could be a good thing to do. So you might do that you know, a week after they sign up. Maybe a couple days later, you'll send a, a second piece of premium content. And then maybe after 12 days, you'll remind them of some of the things they've learned in those previous emails, uh, and explain how your, your product would benefit them, and then, then link to your sales page. So this would be you know, relatively uh, not aggressive. So we've got you know, five emails before you get your promotion, but it's also just a little under two weeks. So you know, if you, you're teaching people you know, what you have to offer before you're pitching them. So again, that's something you want to test. You know, think about how, uh, how long you want people to go through this sequence before they get you know, hit with, with what you eventually want them to do. So that's all stuff you can, you can customize. Another thing, I was just kind of fishing through my, my inbox recently to, to show you one thing. So let's com compare these two emails I got from, from newsletters. You know, one from the newspaper, one from a bowling organization compared to this one. So this one illustrates the question, you know, do you want to design these really nice looking email templates, you know, with graphics and things, or should you just go with the plain map of this text? And that's one good thing about basically all the services, MailChimp, Bayweather, and the others I discuss, other ones you, you maybe you've already heard of or you would look up and discover. They give you pretty easy ways to, to use pre-built templates to fill in graphics and you know make things look a little nice like this. Um, I think that's another question you just want to ask yourself. You know, what is my blog or business? You know, if you're in, say, graphics or you know something where you want to share, you know, very beautiful looking templates, then that's probably the route you should go. But uh, I've found that if you're really just sharing information and content, it's it's better to kind of get rid of all that uh, flashy looking stuff and just kind of get straight to the point. So this is an email um, you can see it where. Uh, it's you know, very personalized. The blog author gives sort of an update of what he's been doing, links into some of the latest posts he has. Uh, you don't really want to lose people with you know just a bunch of a bunch of busy stuff going on. So that's again another thing that's sort of niche dependent, and also dependent on you know what uh, what type of expertise are you trying to provide. If, if you're you know, a real brand, you're, you're a company that you want to impress big clients, you know then you probably do want something that looks nice, so it gives you some credibility. But if you're just trying to you know, teach individuals particular skill, a lot of times text is a better route to go. And then here's kind of a final point I wanted to make, uh, the subject line. So we've talked a little bit about you know, what to say in your messages, but the subject line is crucial for you know, getting people to click, uh, actually open your email is the first step, and getting them to click on your website is kind of the second. So you know, this could actually be probably a presentation on its own, but I just wanted to cover a couple of key principles. That, uh, that are important. So the first thing is to really keep it short. So again, I've seen studies where they were testing a longer subject line versus a shorter one. The shorter one almost always wins. Uh, because people obviously scan through their, their inbox. Also, the, uh, the amount of people who would be viewing on a mobile device, they'll often just see the first couple of words of your email. So you want to make sure your important words are kind of at the beginning. So people on smartphones you know, are kind of glancing, they'll see what your email's about right there, you know, giving you this long sentence. They have to kind of guess what it's about, so you probably won't open it. Um, a couple strategies, there's a lot of good strategies. I just picked a few that I think I've seen in a lot of uh, situations. One of those is to ask questions to you know, pique uh, your, your reader's curiosity. So I just kind of was looking around for good subject lines. So would you do this for money? I'm, I'm interested, I might open that up. Uh, 
Um, something we, we maybe heard before, and I've, I've certainly heard a lot, is, is emphasizing benefits over features. So not um, <coughs> view my writing course with seven modules and you know 40 hours of video. Not write a blockbuster in 30 days. That's what you're going to get out of it, not what it is. So that would be benefits over features. And then finally, there's this um, you know this kind of idea that we're just naturally drawn to lists. I'm sure maybe you're sick of lists by now, but you see a lot of things, with numbers, like the top 10, this or that. That can be effective in an email. It's you know, straight to the point. Gets people kind of intrigued. I think it's something about numbers and lists that just gets our brains kind of interested, and we can uh, use that to our advantage in, in email marketing. I've got a few sources here, so I talked, kind of mentioned a lot about these you know, different studies. So if any of you are really interested in seeing some of that data, there's a few links, but I can I can share more of those with you. Uh, and I wanted to save a little bit of time, so uh, again, if, if you're if you're interested in this, I know we're all at kind of different stages. So if you're you know, already doing email uh, email lists and you're building it up, or if you're kind of a beginner, you know, I really hope you can um, seek me out. So again, the email and Twitter here, and we've also saved a few minutes. So if there's any questions, I'd love to kind of open it up and uh, see if there's anything you, you want to hear more about. So if anybody have any questions? Yes. Okay. Um, the company I work for, we have 17 different franchises, and they're all location specific. So how and our our blog or press releases are kind of on one page. So how would I implement like an emailing list that's location specific? Right. So that would be, yeah. So that's a good what question. Was question. So the question was, if, if you're working for say a company and you have you know one blog that's shared on all your locations. Yeah. So you have one blog, but it's you know 15 or let's say 17 <laughs> different uh, regional offices. So. How would you get people to sign up but have location-specific information? And that would go back to the idea of segmentation. So you could potentially do that upon sign-up. Uh, you could, you know, capture their email. But I guess with that many, maybe you wouldn't want like, a drop-down menu that might be too many to, to click from. But you can ask them a question either in that first email. You know, choose, you know, where do you live? Uh, nice to meet you. And then how they do that, um, it gets captured in their information in your email service. And then when you go to compose your emails, you'll have your, your master list. So obviously, if you have a blog post you want everyone to see, send that out to your full list. If you have a city-specific update, you could uh, you could go in and it would just ask you, you know, choose to send to full list or list segment. So you can say, I want this to go to my dating people, and that will go right there. So kind of the nuts and bolts do depend on whether you choose Mailchimp or, or Aweber. I believe they they also give you a pretty easy way to, to segment that list. Yeah, so that's a good question. Anybody else have a question? Yes? Of the ones you mentioned, um, we, where I currently work, we have uh, quite a few different locations like they have, but we already have lists built up at some of them. And so, which of those would you say were the easiest to work with as far as importing what you already have and possibly exporting what you capture into some Right, right. So I've done that some in Mailchimp, and it's it's worked. It sort of depends on what the format is. So if you're, if you're coming from a different service, I would probably recommend just actually googling you know the two services and seeing if they kind of match up. Uh, so if you have a list in some other program, search that Mailchimp, search that Aweber, see if it sounds like a smooth integration. Um, they all should be able to import either CSVs or, or other uh, common formats you would have. And it typically is a pretty smooth process, so that, that should be should be doable. So, any any other questions? Yes. Regarding privacy, is there uh, certain recommendations or requirements with regard to safeguarding email lists and names that you have to offer up as what part of your site's privacy policy, or how do how does that work? Yeah, so that's that's a great question too. Um, so this is I'd probably say a couple different things. So first, uh, the reason this kind of works the way it does is is almost all the services are double opt in. So as far as thinking about the privacy, you, you get a confirmation message. They have to click a link to say I really do want this. Um, so there are like anti spam laws. That, the good thing is that all the services follow them. So as long as you just do what they say uh, when you're signing up, you're, you'll be fine. So one of those is is offering you know that op double opt in process. So you can't just you know, sign up your your enemies and give them all these emails. 
Um, so you have to actually confirm that you wanted the updates. Um, along with that, you usually need to give actually a, a physical address. Uh, they often require you to have like a street address just associated with your account, so that cuts back on spam. Uh, another thing is you, you need to give a pretty easy way to unsubscribe. So that's usually what you want to worry about the most is make sure that people have an option to unsubscribe and that you're you know just adding all the information that, that Mailchimp asks you or AWeber asks you. Uh, they're gonna you know they know what you have to do to, to stay in line with those with those anti spam rules and you'll, you'll be able to, to follow those. Anything else? How many of you have actually do work with an email list, either for your own business or something like that? Okay, so a pretty good deal of you. Anyone want to share something that's worked well, or you know, either a freebie you offer, or a promotion, or a series of emails that you think has been effective? Who wants to get put on the spot? What's that? We're all imposters. <laughs> yeah, we're all imposters. Or anything else? Any other points anyone would add? I mean, obviously this is not your typical conference. I know we all we all have that expertise to share. How to build your email list? That's where we're struggling. You know, we have had it, and it's it's really good. And I know that <coughs> you know, in some respect, but do you have any tips on how to build it? Yeah. So do you do you have like a blog? Or? We have a website that has a blog, and okay. we already have the opt-in free ebook. Mm -hmm. um, we have an Ebook on Amazon. Um, we're on every social media. That, but I, I think we have to kind of focus on social media. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I think we're kind of heading towards. Okay. Just focusing. Yeah, but I mean, I would probably say in situations like that, you do want to be like as targeted as you can. And as you're thinking about that, you know, we always say growing your email list is what you want. But it's not really about you know the, the raw numbers. It's about the responsiveness of that audience. So you know, for you, you, you want to really think who in your ideal you know list member, your subscriber, who would that be, and where where are they hanging out? So again, you probably don't want to try to manage six social networks, but maybe just one or two. Um, you know, trying to get high quality traffic to your, your blog pages, your opt-in forms. Uh, and that's another good thing about all these services is they let you kind of track like the responsiveness of your list. So it'll show you, you know, I sent out this campaign and 25% opened the email, 18% clicked on this link. So as you start to build it a little more, you know, see, you know, I got all this traffic from Facebook, but they never opened my emails. Um, you know, maybe I need to try somewhere else. So definitely want to just evaluate as we go. Yes. Some of my clients, they don't have anything to give away necessarily because like. A CPA firm or an insurance company, what can they, how can they hook people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I think you sort of see the similar similar thing in a lot of industries where, you know, it's, it's some expertise you're providing, but it doesn't always lend itself to something. I've seen people have success with, um, say, creating, it's it's essentially like an ebook or just a quick, you know, quick tips guide. So if it's top 10 tips to top 10 tips to do this, and it's things okay. that you, you know, that you will do for your clients, but you're just putting it kind of in, in a nice looking format, so, so they'll have it right there. So I think that, that might be something to pursue that I've definitely seen success. Uh, looks like we are quickly running out of time, so I think that'll be it for me. But again, please do uh, just track me down to ask me questions or you know, follow me or shoot me an email if you want to discuss things more. Thanks for being here this morning.